Thanks so much, Lucia. And thanks, John, for organizing this session and organizing such a great forum as well. I was hoping to be there with you all in person, but uh, had some travel hiccups uh, in Houston with some weather that came in yesterday. And so uh, I guess that's the great thing about the, the time we live in now that we can we can have kind of these virtual interactions still, though. And uh, and I was actually telling John that because of his invite, I, I was uh, kind of interested in reading a little bit more about military strategy. And so I read Sir Lawrence Friedman's great book, Strategy of History, and it, and it spoke about some of the scholars there at the War College. So I was excited to be able to to go there. And so a little bit bummed that I'm I'm not there with you all today, but I'm excited, as Lucy was saying, to to be able to share some of the ideas. Uh, and again, to this point of, of thinking broadly about strategic leadership, um, this has been a topic obviously in organizational research for many, many years, but it really only started to coalesce in the late 1970s. So if you go to the next slide, we have a, a specific focus in the 1960s and 70s as the field of strategic management was coming together with the idea that the environment really matters. And so some of you might be familiar with Michael Porter's work, uh, specifically in the IO economics perspective and how that influences organizational performance through the structure conduct performance model. Uh, but but kind of extending that that work in, in the area of strategic management in the late 1970s with the advent of the Strategic Management Society and the founding of the Strategic Management Journal, we start to see the field of strategy coalescing. And at that time, there wasn't as much of that focus on strategic leadership. Really, it was in the late 1970s and early 80s when Don Hamburg and his colleagues started to really focus on the executive team and Hamburg and, and Finkelstein uh, and Canella provide an overview of, of that broader perspective. Much of that, though, is reflected in this framework that, uh, that Don had with a, a special issue in Strategic Management Journal on what is strategic leadership, how should we define it, and what is it? And you can see broadly the ideas that the characteristics of the leaders, what they do and how they do it really matter. And it influences the organization in terms of strategies, structures and processes, uh, and, and directly affects firm performance. It also is, is influenced by the environment as well. And so that, that's kind of a key thing. Um, now, the question of what do we know and what has maybe been established, that it's an interesting question because over the last 25 years in strategic management, we've really been trying to address some of the challenges that come along with measuring strategy. And I think this is probably similar whether you're studying strategy in the organizational context or in the military context. We know strategy is endogenous. It, it is in a lot of ways chosen by the strategic leaders because of some outcome they're looking to achieve. That makes methodologically it problematic to try to, to examine something like that. And so there are things that I think we're revisiting because of that. But one thing we do know is that leaders matter. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this actually builds on some work that I've done, but but it's actually really uh, an ongoing debate. And there's been several studies that have looked at this uh, going back to Lieberson and O'Connor in the 1970s, uh, 1972, actually. Uh, but we've had several, several researchers focus on the CEO effect and looking at firm performance and saying, how much variance can we explain in terms of, um, say, return on assets from looking at the different executives? Uh, and so we actually did study, my colleague Marcus Fitz and I, where we looked at the executive team, in particular the chief executive officer and the board chair, and we found that that explains about 20% of variance in firm performance. Uh, and if you look at that, it's only second to the firm itself in terms of what we can actually explain. Uh, and there you can see that most of the variance is unexplained, 49%, and that reflects a variety of different conditions. Uh, luck as well that that we just can't explain directly, but leaders really matter. And so that certainly is one thing that I think is probably evident, but at the same time, something that, that we have certainly focused a lot on to, to see if we can actually determine how much an executive matters to his or her organization as well. Next slide. So going back to kind of the broader perspective of strategic leadership, as I was mentioning, uh, 
some of the work that, that Don Hamrick has done in particular has really focused the perspective. And so Hamburg and Mason 1984 introduced this framework, which is really an information processing perspective that suggests that the characteristics of the executive is really going to influence how they interpret the environment, how they approach strategy more generally, how they construe their reality, and that leads to the strategic choices that they ultimately make. And so a lot of the work builds from that. And the early perspective was that, well, perhaps we can take the observable characteristics of the executive. And so you can see things like age and tenure, uh, the educational background, military experience. And if we can use those to understand why executives might perceive the environment the way they do and why they might make the decisions they do as well. And so this really became, I think, the foundation for a lot of the work we've seen over the last 35 years uh, in this particular area uh, and, and looking at kind of the, the field of strategic leadership, at least from the organizational perspective as well. Next slide. And so just to capture that, this is actually in the special issue that John uh, put in the in the uh, the chat. Uh, this was a paper that did a review of strategic leadership specifically, and there's actually been quite a few reviews over the time. Uh, Carpenter and colleagues did one in the early 2000s. Uh, the book I was mentioning before, Fink Finkelstein and colleagues, 2009, provides just a great overview of strategic leadership from the organizational perspective. But this paper more recently has provided just a, a wonderful overview of what we kind of know about, about strategic leaders in the organizational context. And, and so again, you can see that some of those key questions that we ask, what do strategic leaders do? Why do they do it? And how do they do it has been a central focus. And, and so we're certainly starting to see more research on the executive characteristics, but also how executives interact. And so this idea of CEO TMT interface or top management team interface, CEO board interface and how those dynamics emerge and, and occur and how that leads to the strategic decisions that they end up making. And I think uh, this is gonna be reflected in the next two presentations as we kind of dig into the values and characteristics of the leaders, but also the context and, and one of the key insights from, from upper echelon's theory is the role that managerial discretion plays. How much per discretion does an individual feel that they have so that they can see all the strategic choices that, that are available and afforded to them in a lot of ways as well. Next slide. One thing in particular though that we see is that there has been a lot of work on individual differences. And so just to give you a, an overview, uh, qu very quick, broad overview of some of the findings. There has been a lot of research that's been done on the big five personality characteristics, openness to new experiences, conscientiousness, agreeableness, emotional stability, and extroversion. These kind of very broad personality characteristics that we find and, and consistently find that they have influences on a variety of uh, employee level outcomes, but also organizational level outcomes. And so at the executive level, seeing these big five characteristics and, and what they might lead to, just to give an example with uh, openness to new experience, research clearly finds that, that executives who have uh, broader openness to, to new experiences are more likely to have strategic flexibility and they're more likely to engage in strategic change as well. Um, thinking about locus con of control or how much control an individual feels they have over, the over their own future, that often leads CEOs uh, to engage in more innovation and, and take on more risk as well. Um, one of the insights that Judge and colleagues had was that there are these kind of core self evaluation characteristics uh, reflecting kind of the uh, generalized self efficacy, self esteem, locus of control, and emotional stability. So, this, these combined characteristics of how we see ourselves and how we see the environment. And, Hiller and Hamburg actually talk about this idea of hypercore self at an executive level. So strategic leaders may be further on the, the distribution when it comes to core self-evaluation. They may perceive themselves as very capable and they may see themselves as less influenced by the environment uh, because of that. And, and so they talk about this as a, as a form of, of hubris potentially or overconfidence, but executives 
and strategic leaders certainly have a higher level of core self-evaluation than the general population. As I was mentioning uh, with overconfidence, uh, there's been quite a bit of work more recently on narcissism, hubristic tendencies, and, and overconfidence, and recognizing that uh, executives may make decisions because they, they want to maintain uh, that spotlight on them. And so we've seen quite a bit of that in terms of organizations overpaying for acquisitions uh, when they when they have an executive who has narcissistic tendencies, at least, uh, as well. There's also been some more recent research that's looked at the positive side of some of these characteristics. So we often see these as, as relatively negative, but CEOs that at least have overconfidence are more likely to lead to breakthrough innovation. So it's kind of interesting to see both the negative, but also the positive coming out now in research. And then uh, even, even more recently, we're starting to see almost uh, as a swing of the pendulum from the focus on CEO narcissism to the focus on CEO humility. Uh, Amy O in particular has done quite a bit of research on this idea and has, has showed that uh, CEOs who uh, are more humble are more likely to engage with their executive team and collaborate and their organizations overall perform much better. Uh, next slide. So in our special issue, uh, which we also did uh, with Mike Hitt and our colleague uh, JP Benardi, we uh, we tried to provide kind of an overview of strategic leadership uh, and an overview of the special issue that that we did. But we also wanted to to kind of lay out some future research questions, which was kind of a fun exercise because we get to take different topics from each of our research uh, foci. Uh, and so you can see some of the things that we we focused on with what are some of those unanswered questions around leadership characteristics and uh, thinking about leader board interactions, which is actually specifically related to my research, as, as John was was indicating. And so I, I'm really fascinated in the public corporation, how the board of directors operates within the strategic leadership um, area. We also talked about key questions and vision and purpose that, that are still there to, to be answered and strategy implementation as well. And so I think there's a lot that, that's there that uh, that we still need to do. And we're really only scratching the surface when it comes to, to the work in strategic leadership. Uh, next slide. The other thing that, that I just wanted to speak on briefly is just kind of the the methodological challenges that I was I was talking about earlier. So again, organizational research broadly has some key challenges, but strategic leadership in particular has some key challenges around causality. And it's in part because we examine complex interrelated factors that are trying to drive competitive advantage, firm performance, and other outcomes. Uh, these are very challenging in part because Ideally, what we would like to do as social scientists is manipulate this and and be able to randomly assign different strategies. Uh, but because of strategic leaders, we're not obviously able to do that. And so it makes for answering calls of questions quite challenging. And so um, that really is the the reality here. And and so it, it certainly rep represents a challenge, but also I think what we're seeing now is this recognition of the causal revolution that's been going on in a number of fields, in particular economics. So two years ago, the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded to three scholars because of their work in, in natural experiments. And this idea that we are really at the beginnings of a causal revolution, um, in particular, Judea Pearl's work and his book, The Book of Why, which was just a, fantag a, a fabulous read on, on causal thinking. But we're seeing some of these things come into strategic management and strategic leadership as well in, uh, in the organizational research domain. Next slide. And some of this is reflected in some methodological advances that we're seeing. Uh, the ability to, to look at new data sources, to collect those new data in, in unique ways, and the advent really of, of the availability of big data, and seeing that as a key opportunity to, to better assess some of those research questions that go back to why executives make the decisions they do. Within data coding, we're seeing things like machine learning and AI and in particular, natural language processing that is allowing researchers to study questions uh, more directly with, with interview data from executives to try to assess their characteristics and their personality. My colleague Steve Bobie and, and, uh, 
his co-authors have really delved deep into this and it's opening up opportunities as well. Uh, the interesting thing too, though, is we're seeing that machine learning and, and artificial intelligence are influencing data analysis as well. And so I think that's going to be a broad theme over the next several years uh, with artificial intelligence, machine learning, really advancing how we think about research questions and the questions that we ask. And, and you know, I, I think there's the possibility of almost a bifurcation of, of those researchers that are engaging with some of these new techniques and, and those that are not. But I, I think there's some real opportunities there. They're going to allow us to continue to ask questions as well. And I will say this is one thing that I think when we look at that academic practitioner gap, one of the things that we see, uh, and this is true for academics as well, some of the methodological challenges that that we face as a field in setting strategic leadership, it also is something that that sometimes practitioners don't understand as well either. Within the field of strategic management, we have books like Good to Great, In Search of Excellence, and, and those type of, of books that herald these great companies that often lead to failure, and that's partly because there's selection bias in that. Uh, again, there, there are things that occur that that are because individuals are making decisions with the outcomes in mind. And uh, from a practitioner standpoint, that has some key implications for how you might uh, engage strategically with a competitor or with a rival or uh, any type of adversary as well. And so um, it, 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 again, represents challenges, but I think it also as we're kind of going into that causal revolution, I, I think uh, provides us with some opportunities to ask some really interesting questions and to revisit a lot of the research that uh, my overview has provided as well. So uh, final slide for me, uh, I think is next. And so thank you again and look forward to answering any questions that you might have as well.